Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for being here. And uh, I'm delighted to be sort of chairing this session uh, where we are going to be looking at uh, a unique technology to look at how we can care for patients who have in-stage renal disease. So what do you think? I mean, the, so this is the panel which I'll take you through. Guys, um, that doesn't... So we've got a great panel here of people who have kidney problems, who look after kidney patients, who have the solution which will help us to treat the patient remotely. And also, we can talk about how the regulation and reimbursement can work, because we were talking about that in the earlier session. What do you think is wrong with this picture? I mean, I talked in the earlier session about the fact that Patients are prisoners of their conditions. And this is a patient of mine. I asked her what does she feel uh, feels like when she has kidney disease and she has to go through. And that's, that's what she did for me. So it just means that looking after patients, keeping them alive in a hospital is not the best way to look after them. There has to be a better way. And this session is really to look at the better way. You know, so... Okay, uh, guys, oh yes. So here really, we are looking at a possibility of a wearable device, which can be a tool to look at remote management of patient care. When we talk about wearable device, there is lots of them available to do few things, but can we have one thing which can do everything? That's the question, you see. So therefore, in this talk, I'll briefly touch upon, for people who are not familiar about the renal disease, what, how big the problem it is, talk about wearable devices, and then at the end, we will look at how we can integrate that in our healthcare. It is a global problem. It is not a problem restricted to one part of the world. And it is getting worse. In some parts of the world, it's worse than cancer. So therefore, it is a problem where we need to do something about it. Because these patients have very challenging time, multiple appointments, and also they have to wait longer and even people on the waiting list, if they are not transplanted, they will die on the waiting list. So today in UK, three people will die. And that's not a guess, it's gonna happen. Three people with kidney disease, on the waiting list, they will die. Now, I'm not the best, I can tell you these things, but I don't have kidney failure. But how can I articulate something which I don't know, or I haven't felt? So therefore, I'm delighted that Deborah Tuval, who's here with us, who is, I can tell you, she's, she's an inspiring person who inspires me a lot of times because she will tell you what her background is, but she's the first patient to have a simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant in UK many years ago. And with that, I'll then let Tepa tell us about his life here. Oh, well, hi, my name's Deborah Duval. Um, I work full time for the largest kidney charity in the UK, Kidney Care UK. So we help the most patients and we spend the most money helping patients. So I do two jobs there. I'm managing editor of our quarterly magazine, which goes out to 20,000 signed up patients. It goes into every renal unit in the country. So if you want to get innovation to patients, you need to speak to me. I also run another project, The Kidney Kitchen, and um, that is bringing the science of dietetics into a language where patients can understand it. And working with uh, chefs across the country, celebrity chefs, bringing those two skills together so that we actually have meals that we can enjoy. A renal diet is a very boring diet. So you'll stick to that for a week, maybe two weeks. It's an, it's an integral part of keeping me well, but I'm only gonna stick to that diet for two weeks as it currently stood five years ago. Kidney Kitchen came along. Um, if I tell you this year on a website that is desperately in need of, of an update, we've had so far 178,000 unique visitors. So Rajesh alluded to my, um, my medical history. So I have managed to work full time around a very complicated medical background. I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was 11. Type 1 diabetes, I needed to take uh, insulin injections. And then I, the, my diabetes caused kidney failure in my late 20s. So I've been through two, three-year sessions of dialysis. 
I've had four, I've had three transplants, transplanting four organs. And the way I've managed my life around that is by persistently trying to take as much as of my care under my own control as I possibly can. But if I tell you that in my 40s, the decade between my 39th birthday and my 49th birthday, I spent 23 and a half months in hospital. That's two years of a, in one decade. And I could almost double that in terms of the outpatient appointments I had to attend. So me, an immuno immunocompromised person, I have to sit in A&E for sometimes five hours with my fistula not, not working properly, not knowing if I'm going to be able to receive effective dialysis. So if I had some sort of way of monitoring my fistula at home that was digitally communicating with my renal team, not only would I not have those appointments only every three months where I know that something's gone wrong, but I can be involved in that care. And I know this technology works because I currently, since my last pancreas transplant failed two years ago, I currently wear a freestyle Libra on my arm. And, I, and so I constantly know my blood glucose levels and I'm very much involved in making sure that they are an acceptable level. If we could do that for kidney patients and we could take some of our care back into our own responsibility, we end up achieving the aim that we set out to achieve in the very first place. And that's when we give patients a transplant, we want them to go and have a normal life. That's the, that's the theory. But in practice, we spend half of our life to and fro in hospital, trying to find parking spaces, waiting in waiting rooms where we're likely to get infection. We can't work because I work for Kidney Care UK and they understand that there's value in employing me because of my experience. But if I worked for a bank, they wouldn't have that. I wouldn't, my, I wouldn't last five minutes in a really responsible job. And I have something to offer. Yeah. So if we can bring back care to the patient, at least we can share in that responsibility. It, it enables us to go and have a normal, domestic, working and family life. The life we all dream of and the life we're promised when we are offered a transplant. So I fully hope that we can start integrating these devices into our care in the UK. Great. Thanks, Deborah. So I think, you know, you, can, you just heard that even after transplant, life is not what a person expects. They want to have a normal life, near normal life, but it's not possible. Still, you have to be back and forth to the hospital. So, how do we address this issue? We need something which gets us to be better prepared. It makes the patient's assessment a lot more dynamic, but it's not there at the moment. What we don't have is something which is remote. So, like what Deborah was saying, can she be at home and have these tests done? Can that predict? problems before that happens, even before the patient has their symptoms from it. Can that be precise? Can it prevent these admissions? And also in this process, can it make a personalized care for that person? So instead of saying 1,000 patients, this is what we want you to do, because on average, this is what we know about you, we can say, this is what we can design for you. So that's what we need. And I think that is where we need to get to and we want to get to. And also on top of that, these are the challenges we have. We need more staff. We need more beds. We need patients to get to the hospital in time. Deborah touched upon waiting in the A&E. You all see in the news. You have to wait for an ambulance for four hours. That cannot be the way we can look after patients in the years ahead. We need all the stakeholders to come together to make it happen, but I think we need to accept and change innovation-based solutions. That's the only way this is going to happen. Otherwise, all we will be doing is doing the same thing, trying the same thing we tried for the last three or four decades. Maybe a bit more quicker, a bit more faster, but it's not going to transform or get to patients what we need to offer them. I don't need to talk to people in here about wearable technology. You all know that there are so many out there. It influences our behavior. For most of us, it's become part of our care, part of our life. We share information, you know, on running clubs, somebody will tell you, I'm doing this today, I'm going there today, so it becomes easier. It makes it easier for peer-to-peer -peer learning as well. 
So therefore, this is something we become part of our life. And that's why I think a technology such as that, which people are used to wearing and living with it, will make it a lot easier to adopt. These are some of the things which are available, different materials, different diseases. So therefore, it is not a new market, but it's really having a device which can offer that everything comprehensive, that's what we need. And these are the number of trials as well. We were talking about getting these, these products validated and integrated into care. These are trials which are going on. So this is a space where there's a lot of attention from the healthcare organizations globally, looking at this as a potential solutions to enhance the patient care. But what is the right device? That's the big question, isn't it? And what is the right device if I'm a patient or when I talk to my patients? They want something which is there. They shouldn't even feel that it is there. They can sleep with it. It doesn't fall apart. It should be tough. It should be friendly. It doesn't look like a huge, bulky thing they have to wear. It should be easy to connect. The data can be showed, stored easily and safely. And for a kidney patient or any patient with heart disease, chronic conditions, these are the things what they need. We need to be able to check their blood tests. We need to be able to look at their vital status, heart rate, oxygenation, and so on. In particular to kidney patients, when they are on dialysis, they will have something called a fistula, which is really we make the vein bigger by doing a surgery so that we can use that to dialyze them three times a week. So can a technology which can measure that tell us about the function of the fistula because that's a lifeline for that person until they are transplanted. So therefore, can they do that? In that process, can it provide a framework about that person so that instead of me telling them this is what you, you do by the average of what we learned from other patients, this is what you do because this is what I learned about you. And that's a technology which is exciting and that's what I think is what I look at. So I'm going to invite Dave to talk about the technology. Yeah. Thank you, Rajesh. So uh, behind me here is, I think, one of the world's uh, greatest humans. Um, so Maddie uh, has sky is a, would like to be called a, a skydiver, has wing walked, uh, worked for uh, Goldman in the city for a while, um, ran the London Marathon. But the thing that she would never want you to describe her at as is a uh, as a dialysis patient, and that's uh, despite the fact that for about the past 20 years or so, uh, multiple times a week she goes home uh, at night, has to hook herself up to a machine at her home, and uh, have the machine effectively replace the work that her kidneys have done. But as Deborah was kind of talking about. Maddie takes really good care of herself, really pays attention to what's going on, but that doesn't mean that she, everybody isn't at risk for something going wrong. So a couple years ago, she was hiking up in Ben Nevis, uh, started to feel a little lightheaded and dizzy, and thought, oh, maybe it's just a hike, what's going on, went home, still felt the same way, and actually found herself uh, in A&E. And the reason for that is that access, that artificial access that Rajesh was mentioning, had unfortunately, after finally about 16 years, started to actually clot off. So her dialysis wasn't working as well as it should. Her electrolytes weren't being uh, managed as well as they should. Her potassium had gotten uh, critically high, and she was at risk for a potentially fatal arrhythmia and was thankfully able to uh, get to A&E fast enough for them to actually reverse the problem. And so that's where, as, as Rajesh has mentioned, we certainly think that there's a need uh, within the market to create a multi-metric ESKD remote patient monitoring. We've seen the rise of wearables, and I think it's certainly important to be non-invasive, wireless, continuous, clinical grade, real time and predictive. Because fundamentally, you have to align the interests of the four Ps, right? The patient, physician, provider, and payer. And that's not just true in terms of preventing and reducing hospitalizations, but also in terms of providing peace of mind for the patient and physician that they're doing the best that they possibly can. So how Aleo does that is we start off with a non-invasive wearable, looks like a little Band-Aid. Uh, patient wears it throughout the day, it's showerproof, sweatproof, go live your life, do what you want to do. Maybe you can't swim the English Channel to get to, to better weather, but that's all right. Um, but that being said, uh, you go about your life, it's collecting data throughout the day without any intervention from the patient. When you get home, that data is going to automatically get pushed up to the cloud. We run our series of proprietary algorithms on it and then push it out to the clinician. And I think it's important. Um, you'll hear from Joanna a little bit in terms of kind of being a lead nurse. She's stuck chasing this down uh, every, single, every single day. You know, they've, they've tried to solve the problem at BARTS by taking uh, data more frequently uh, than the once a month that is typically mandated. But they're still stuck chasing down that data. The patient isn't in the clinic anymore. But now being able to get that data at the right time 
when they can actually intervene when the patient is in front of them in the clinic, and solving the sampling error problem is certainly important. And while we've seen the proliferation of wearables, I think especially during COVID, there's been an interesting problem, right? I think over the last two years, a lot of these devices have effectively, in many ways, become very expensive doorstops. And so being able to do this all in one in a way that fits in with the patient life, that doesn't mean that they have to go do something extra. You're kind of talking about, okay, I can't, I can't go out, you know, in the middle of the meeting and go take my blood pressure because it's 9.15 a.m., right? That's not gonna, that doesn't work. It needs to be able to live with the patient's life. And that's where Aleo's really stepped in. So not just doing your basic vitals like any other good old wearable company can, but really pushing past that uh, into interesting areas of being able to get hemoglobin hematocrit and blood pressure uh, in terms of being able to manage these patients and, and, and the, um, from a from fluid status perspective, but also, quite frankly, uh, in the U.S., uh, being able to stimulate red blood cell pr production, if your kidneys don't do it, you have to take a very expensive drug. That's actually Medicare's single largest drug purchase at the cost of about $4 billion each year. And it's predicted that about 80% of that is wasted. So just being able to manage that alone could be about a $3 billion savings in the US and I think uh, close to about a half a billion pounds here in the UK. Um, you look at things like managing that access better. And then being able to go do things like electrolytes non-invasively, which obviously, once again, really put these patients into the hospital. And that's how we got into a partnership with the NHS. Uh, there was uh, a group up in, the, uh, up in Middlesbrough. Uh, it was sponsored by the HSN uh, for Northeast uh, North Cumbria. They were actually sending nurses, sometimes up to 50 miles each way, to patient homes on the off-dialysis days. And they were taking a blood draw processing it, and they saw they could reduce those hospitalizations uh, for the patient. But as Rajesh kind of mentioned, that is not effective, scalable, remote. It's obviously very expensive. They had to hire an extra five nurses to do that job. The HSN put out an unmet need call. We responded to it and resulted in our partnership with the NHS, ultimately then brought us down here to London as well with Bart's and to help that team uh, out as well. I think it's fundamentally also important to be accurate, right? You can't just have um, kind of close data. I mean, we hear a lot of things about the Apple Watch, and I certainly enjoy wearing mine, but it's nowhere near clinical grade, right? I mean, if you, you really want to make sure that you're comparable to what's out there, and that's always Aaliyah's goal, meeting exceeding the current standard of care and being comparable to the gold standard. So better than a Massimo on your finger uh, in the ICU, better than a finger stick like a HemaQ and still getting that data at an accurate rate. We've kind of mentioned the fact that, you know, whether it's a really interesting component of a single, you know, single payer care uh, in the U.S. is actually only seen in dialysis, interestingly enough, and Ken's going to talk a little bit about that later and then in a second panel later today. But most of that care, once again, is spent on these entirely preventable hospitalizations that boil down to my access failed, my potassium's too high, and I have too much fluid. I mean, the point of dialysis is to take off that fluid. The point of dialysis is to manage my electrolytes. That is incredibly silly that 85% of the reasons these patients spend, on average, 22 days a year in an ICU is because of things that the treatment is supposed to try and solve. And that's a com completely ridiculous uh, standpoint that we can certainly tackle. I think that's what Aaliyah is trying to do here from a standpoint of going through the FDA process uh, with our first clearance over this, uh, earlier this year, second one expected in the next couple months, doing the same thing here with uh, CA and C Mark here across uh, EMEA, and building that out. And I think there's going to be a, a need for, to drive it from the patient level, the nurse level, and the clinician level uh, as we move this forward as well, but an exciting opportunity nonetheless to really meet patients where they are to help keep them out of the hospital and living their best lives. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. I think it's clear to say that, you know, it, it really changes so many things what we do, what we struggle with. And I think we were talking about integration of technology into healthcare, changing healthcare, the basic issue of funding. So therefore, I think it's what some of the, these kind of devices helps us to look at the whole funding of the healthcare differently so that we can keep the patients at home, save the money from there so that you can look at putting that into somewhere else. So. We were delighted, I mean, I think I will briefly tell you, I mean, I looked out for him, you know, because I was chasing him on the LinkedIn, because I think that's the urgency we have, because we see the problems. When I say we, my nursing team, because I do my clinics, I do my surgery, but the people who deliver the care are our nurses. They do all those things. And I mean, delighted Joanna has joined this. She's our specialist nurse uh, who does the actual dialysis process, what we have been talking about, and having that patient contact one-to-one every day of a working week. So the, and we did a project 
looking at how this technology can help us. So I'm delighted that she's going to talk about the project, what we did. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Um, no, you can sit. Yeah, it's okay. You can use it, yeah. Can you do that? Sorry. Sorry. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for this opportunity. First, I'm going to speak about um, delivering non-invasive and remote monitoring of patients with end-stage renal disease. First, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Joanna. I'm one of the senior staff, senior dialysis nurse in Bart's Health. I've been practicing as a dialysis nurse for more than a decade. I'm also a specialist nurse for Indo-AVF and for Bart's and Medtronics. I'm also part of this project, Alio Smart Patch. And now, I'm going to talk about first, what is hemodialysis? Hemodialysis is a treatment for chronic kidney failure patients. It involves puncturing of two needles to patients' AV fistula. And we talk about needles, we are talking about gauge 15, which is the, one of the well, biggest needles that we use for needling the patient. And it's usually very traumatic and uh, painful and also very challenging for us to see patients going for dialysis three times a week. And this uh, treatment um, is invasive. So it uh, usually run by the machine with the 250 or 300 mils per hour. And it, they come for three times a week. And we say AV fistula, it's done by the surgeons like Dr. Rajesh, and it usually sometimes can fail and problems with complications. And thus, therefore, it's very important that we, used to, we have to look after them and their access because none of this will lead them to death or, yeah, early, uh, uh, more problems. The current status of renal patients that we have is that they come for our dialysis unit in the hospital and uh, they require blood tests to confirm their adequacy of their access. And also they have, it's usually invasive, which I said earlier, it takes two needles or their fistula has to be punctured every time. And, it, and imagine this is uh, three times a week dialysis. And there's no other way other than going to the hospital. And we need a remote, dynamic, and non-invasive tools such as this smart patch. The single study that we used um, together with our team is that uh, we evaluate allium medical remote monitoring ability to measure blood components in hemodialysis, such as the like urea, which is creatinine, potassium. And the method we use is all of, most of them are obviously uh, adult, having a fistula or a graft um, access. And they, they, we use the patch, but we need to make sure that it's uh, dry and, and clean before to adhere this uh, patch over the functioning fistula. And we take bloods pre-dialysis and post-dialysis. And the demographics we use is for to take our uh, collected were blood results, um, staff and patients uh, satisfaction. The results that we come up were the 50, uh, 35, actually we piloted 35 patients on our study and all of them were comfortable using the patch because it's actually non-invasive. Uh, unfortunately, there were two patches that has removed because of their challenging fistula. But other than that, there was no issues uh, happen. The results that we come up were the mean were 61 years of age, and most of them were old, and the highest were 51 to 70 years old, and female are more participated. And the satisfaction we get were no issues or whatever, they all have positive feedback, even from the staff, because it's very easy to use. And the satisfaction that we gathered uh, throughout the study were patient felt cared, 
they were felt that they are looking looked after at home and they're even happy to bring it with them and some of the patients they want to do that as a self-care and even uh, the staff there was no problem with it uh, and the fob that we set up is very easy as well in summary um, the data that we gathered from blood tests that we took every month for the patients and the compar in comparison to Alio Smart Patch who's taking the blood results from our patients, which is not invasive, are more likely the same, so it's really effective. And the patients were assured and interested with it and they're actually looking and I think Alio Smart Patch is the key for the future for patients who are actually struggling every time for their fistula uh, to be punctured every time. Uh, my personal reflections were even up to now, so, um, we are still frustrated as nurses in dialysis because these um, non-invasive products are still not available to be used for uh, patients. And still we are very passionate that this will be able to integrate in renal, renal dialysis. And I'm looking forward for this opportunity to use this in the future. And also our patients have been, the study has been done since 2021 of December, but up to now they're still waiting for it and they're actually looking forward to it. Thanks, and, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So that's what, where it is, you know, so therefore when we did the pilot, the patients were really so eager, and these are older patients, you would think they'll be a bit technically averse. You'll be thinking they'll be scared. So therefore, it showed that the patients really see that their life can change if this can be used. So we were talking about sort of a product which we piloted it. It's part of a larger study globally to show that this is safe, easier to use, and patient adopts it. What that means is really the next phases. I mean, we were talking earlier about how do you integrate these things? How do you get the reimbursement? Because that's the key. So we've got Ken, you know, who I'm delighted that he is here from US, to talk about his experience on the US side, how a product can be brought into market, but more importantly, regulatorily approved and reimbursed. Ken. Yeah. Great, thank you, and great to be here. Uh, with everyone, my name is uh, Ken Callahan. I spent the last 10 years uh, working in the US government. Uh, final position I had was uh, chief of staff and senior advisor to the uh, uh, to the secretary at the US Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so that is the mother agency that oversees CDC, uh, FDA, National Institutes of Health, uh, CMS, and about 25 other agencies. Uh, so and right, right away, uh, when, when we got into the role, um, we started looking at how could we disrupt and help improve kidney care. Because when we got in, we looked at um, the Medicare payroll and the beneficiaries. So Medicare is, as many of you probably know, is 465 and above in the U.S. Has an annual budget, which is hard to believe, exceeds $1 trillion in U.S. every single year, 70 million Medicare beneficiaries. So we, we knew um, that we had to take a look and be very, very cognizant of how we are going to spend taxpayers' money on that. Now, what people might not know is now, it's for Medicare, usually for people over 65 and above. However, if you're on dialysis, it's one of the two conditions, regardless of what age you are, Medicare is going to cover it and pay for it. So uh, in 2020, for example, we realized uh, there's 900,000 people in the U.S. on dialysis. And anywhere from about, that's 1% of the Medicare beneficiaries, so 1% of the 70 million people but it's nearly one in seven dollars that Medicare spends. So Medicare is spending hundreds of billions of dollars every single year on dialysis patients, and it's not improving care. Um, and you heard from Deborah before, it, unfortunately, the innovation has not really improved much in the last 50 years. Um, if you go in the US, you go to a cancer center in 1970 to 2020, um, completely different, the care has completely changed. However, if you go into a dialysis center in 1970 in the US, Verse 2020, you know, there might be nicer couches, the music might have changed, uh, it might have changed a little bit, but the whole delivery of care hadn't really changed. So one of the things that we started looking at was how can we disrupt it? How can we in innovate it? Because really, uh, you know, for Senius, the Davidas, a lot of the big companies in the U.S. who do dialysis, you know, we were paying them to, to 
to do dialysis. So that's what they did. There was no incentive for innovation. So one thing that we looked at was how can we, how can we spur this innovation? And so a few things we looked at was paying for remote patient monitoring companies. Um, you know, uh, Deborah can talk about this and I'm, as she has, but one thing we heard a lot from kidney patients was they didn't want to be, they didn't want to have something inserted in them again. Um, they get pricked all the time, their fistula, um, the last thing that they want to do is be pricked again or have something inserted in them again. So it was on us and, and the government to think about how can we pay for something that is going to make the patient's lives better. So we created a bunch of new Medicare codes that would pay for that. Um, and they're just going to fruition right now. Another thing we did was creating a public-private partnership called uh, KidneyX. Uh, KidneyX was the largest public-private partnership between the government and, uh, and the kidney organizations in the U.S. ever created. Uh, paid over $100 million to, uh, for people who were trying to spur innovation in the kidney space. Um, it was really good because for the first time, uh, we got people who had never really thought about it who were applying for, for grants and trying to challenge the status quo. Um, and that's actually how I met, uh, met Dave at a Leo Medical. They received a, a $1 million a grant from the government when, when we were there. Um, and so what we continue to see, though, is in the U.S., it's at, there's a tip of the iceberg. We have about 1 million people right now, maybe closer to 850,000 people who are on dialysis. We have another 35 million people who have maybe been misdiagnosed or not correctly diagnosed who are on the verge or might already have chronic kidney disease and could easily be on dialysis in the, in the near future. So what we're hoping, um, and w part of what I've worked with, with Dave and Ali over the last two years is making sure that once they get FDA approved, that they can get paid by Medicare and improve the lives of these patients. Because uh, as I mentioned before, they don't want to be pricked again. They want to have the peace of mind. And so, yeah, it's, because uh, it, as into talking, making it a little bit more about the hospitals, um, over uh, 75 or $80 billion in the U.S. is spent every single year from a dialysis patient uh, having to go to the hospital. So what can you do to keep them out? Um, you know, redoing the, redoing the Medicare models, paying for new innovation, and, you know, using devices like Aleo Medical that can track you remotely and give patients the peace of mind, um, you know, save patients' lives, and, you know, also save the government, hopefully, a lot of money as well. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, I, think, I mean, we will be extending this conversation in the next session. I think we are doing it at 3 o'clock on the ICS Congress, so we will be extending this conversation. But really, and I think, you know, Ken, this integration, we are talking about you know, the regulatory side of things, what patient needs is, what staff feel when they use it, and the CEO's perspective of bringing this into, from the bench to that. But are we ready? Our healthcare sector is ready for this. These are, this is a fantastic study done by uh, a group where they looked at attitude to technology globally on the clinicians, i.e. the healthcare team. And you can see that we feel that being technologically adept is extremely important. We feel that It'll, patients will want to know more. We know that real-time analytics is important for patient management. 70% of us in the study done, which is global study, we felt that health tech will help to transform the healthcare. And 63% of us felt that the future of healthcare is going to be telehealth, and it will improve the patient experience. So the healthcare sector is ready, not 100%, certainly more than 50%. We are ready to receive it as long as the partnership is built towards a fruitful one for both sides. And in my head, this is what the hospital used to be. 90s, it's driven by a doctor telling them what to do. Now, there is a more of a manager role. There's a nurse who acts as a manager. But what I really want to get to is this. I want the patient to be a coordinator. I don't want a doctor to be there. Patient sits at home, has a problem, triggers actions. Hospitals get ready before they come. And if you ask me, are we there? We are not far from it. Because and that one, this possibility is only is going to become real is by partnering with digital technologies. It's not going to happen by any other way. What that means is patients feel that they have complete control of what's happening to them to treat their problem. There's all the sort of Europeans, Europeans and UK, we are all getting ready towards it. The laws are coming in, so therefore, I think things are moving faster, I would say, 
post covid so that we can get to the point where we don't need to, we can look at these things so patients for example they know what they want but they have difficulty trusting what's offered to them they don't know the technology person will they worry about the data safety hospitals we have large data we don't have money to employ a person to do ai or somebody to uh, develop a ai product so we want to partner with the right person to do that and also we also worry about the data safety and the risks for it so therefore there is always that issue industry of course industry presented here you have the access to funding and up to date technology but we reckon i recognize that you have a timeline you have investors jumping on you saying what's happening next so therefore if all these three can talk in the same way understand each other's issue i think that partnership is the key for us to get to the point where i think the hospital can be a patient driven not organization or clinician driven so the how we can do that these are some of my suggestions we need to find people who can champion these things you know having a technology alone doesn't make a difference you need to have champions to champion these things because the organizational culture hasn't changed it is changing i said earlier the door is slightly open we need to open it more get people engaging more collaborate with key patient organizations debra leads the kidney care uk largest kidney association in uk we need to partner with them work with them so they then the patient can care can become patient centered predictive personalized and if you think oh come on you are talking dreams it's not going to happen these are some of the things we are working on so therefore these things we are already working on to change the patient care so therefore anybody who thinks nhs is difficult and you can't get through it is happening it just finding the right people to start with and then scale it up so that we can get to the point where we can offer a patient care which is personalized so that the patient who felt like that she can feel like this thank you very much everyone and i think uh, we can take few questions if you have any questions yeah my can i borrow the mic yeah there we go hi thank yeah that was uh, really interesting and forgive me i'm not an expert in the field so this might not be quite the right question but i understand um what where alio is positioned in terms of hemodialysis <coughs> excuse me could you comment on where does peritoneal dialysis fit into the picture here because my understanding is that's actually much less invasive and you can do it at home so uh, i wasn't here at the beginning so forgive me if you already mentioned that but just be interested in your comments on that yeah actually let's see uh, um the kind of the next uh, clearance we'll be going after uh, is to actually the same underlying technology the same patch can be placed on a radio or brachial carotid etc we've done, we've seen good data there already that's what goes in takes us past your current hemodialysis patient to your peritoneal patient maybe if they unfortunately have a catheter uh you know a central line or a catheter um as well uh we're able to to monitor those patients as well so the goal once again is any patient on ESKD but then since we can get that same data off the radial and brachial into that uh you know that CKD population right we all know the CKD population is 20 30 times 40 times larger than your ESKD population and can you get them uh where they want to go and if if Rajesh will permit me to kind of jump off that question a little bit that's where i think that's the real goal right the real goal is managing these drugs for these patients you know in a much more titratable fashion right can we manage is there a chatbot that tells a patient hey we noticed your potassium is riding a little high you should take an extra potassium binder part of the reason why uh we had an interesting problem when we were doing our FDA validation study for potassium which was well how do we show the FDA that we can accurately get a patient with a potassium of 9 right i mean we're certainly not going to find one walking around here today right but interestingly we actually went out uh to both riyadh and uh, amman during ramadan because a lot of the, the more observant will not uh take dialysis during the day because they see it as a nutrition source and so they would and they typically break fast with potatoes bananas dates wonderfully high potassium foods so they would come in with a, we had patients coming in with a potassium of 9 9.5 which is something you'd never find but if we could just you know integrate some of those solutions together to help manage that for the patient proactively and just say hey during this time you have to be a little bit more careful i think that's where it's going to go yeah. but i think it needs a big uh, regulatory change yeah. as well to help make it happen and i think it just means that that person doesn't need to worry about that they can adjust it 
and Deborah will tell you, you can eat better food, isn't it? You can eat food what you like, not a restricted food what you are given or told. Any other questions? Uh, when you're all reflecting on about it, I think, Deborah, do you, what do you think this will enable to achieve, which you don't have at the moment? Um, this kind of, yeah. Well, yeah. So essentially, uh, well, two things more control, more involvement in our care. And if we're involved in our care, then we're going to be more compliant. I'm not a fan of that word because that implies that I've been somehow a bad person if something's gone wrong. However, it's a medical term. I use it in a medical context. If I'm involved and I can share the responsibility, I'm likely to have a better outcome. Let's put it that way. Secondly, you know... I never wanted kidney disease. I didn't want diabetes. I wanted a fulfilling life. And if I can still achieve almost all of those things that I wanted by taking some of that care away from the hospital and not having to keep going in and out of the hospital all the time and the expense that that involves to me, not just the NHS, in terms of financial ex expense and my time, if I can, you know, if we can find a way to work together to save some of that, then it's going to be beneficial. But in terms of a patient experience, like I've had hundreds of hundreds of thousands of needles in me and they're painful. I don't want those needles in me. I hate it. I still look away after all of these years. I still can't bear to look at anybody poking these needles. And, and Joanne will confirm the needles we use in dialysis are much, they're much bigger than the needles we use for injections. The ones we use for injections. So I currently have five, six injections every single day. Um, and that's okay. I'm kind of, you know, I, I accept that. But if I then go into hospital and I have a dozen blood tests for different reasons, if we can do it without piercing my skin, my life changes. Yeah. My, my absolute life changes. So, yeah, I think, massively important. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think it just means that it transforms. We were talking about transforming healthcare. That's what we need to position into and what I think involved in this technology specifically, I think that's where I think it can position ourselves to look at the way we can look after patients more specifically. David, is there anything you want? And since we're talking about kind of the future of hospitals, I think one, one last thing that I would add into this is there's a rise, you know, one of the, the rise of uh, dialysis is more home hemo. So Joanna talked about enabling self-care, pushing these patients to home. I think something that the NHS does really, really well is getting patients involved in taking their weights, self-cannulating, getting them more involved in their diet much, much earlier than, than we do in the U.S. That's why we came out here to work with them. And that's why we've been partnering with some, some of the different home uh, hemo companies, ones up uh, close to Birmingham called Quanta. And I think the joint North Star is, well, if the patient can do their dialysis at home, the 85% of time that they're not on a dialysis machine during the week, if we understand where they are in terms of their fluid and their electrolytes, that, that roller coaster that this patient goes on, if we can optimize for that, that's going to be completely different. But it's going to, I think the biggest hurdle is on the regulatory side of understanding what that means, but I think also on the reimbursement side. Obviously, right now, dialysis clinics, you've got maybe four, six, eight patients all using one machine. Now, if you're going to have to buy a machine for every single patient, are we okay with that? The capital equipment cost might be large, but the overall reduction in cost yeah. and, and, and the betterment for patients and the overall... The future hospital, I think, very much is at the patient home, and that's, that, this, this will be a vanguard for that for Exactly. That I think, you know, it, it's something. We're going to continue the conversation in the next session at 3. Please join us. But once again, thank you, everyone, for participating today, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you.